Hello and welcome to Sound Heal Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brown, and thank you so much for joining me as we continue to explore the fields of sound healing, sound therapy, and generally the use of sound for health and wellness. You can also, if you're listening uh, on audio, you can join us and watch the interviews on the YouTube channel, Sounds Heal Studio. Today, our guest is Eric Lawrence, who has toured the world playing the saxophone, flute, and as a composer. And he has shared the stage with many legendary masters. So we hear some wonderful stories about his musical career um, as a touring musician, uh, growing up in the jazz world, um, and actually really how that uh, education, both uh, studying, but especially the experience of performing with others, um, has lent itself to the work that he's doing now with the therapeutic use of sound and sound healing, how there really is this crossover uh, through the expressive arts, um, jazz in particular, the improvisation, the listening uh, skills that you need to have, as well as what a spiritual experience music always has been for Eric. So I don't want to give too many stories away, but I just found this to be just a fascinating a conversation, uh, really a, a pleasure to to hear from Eric and all his experiences on his musical path, his interests as a musician in music therapy and sound healing, and these beautiful sound sanctuary uh, experiences, both one on one and group group sound healing that he offers now. Also, at the end of this episode you'll get to listen to one of his improvisations called Deep Resonance Sacred Beings. Absolutely beautiful. So I hope you enjoy that as well. This episode is sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa, located online at theohmshop.com. And if you're able to get there in person in Sarasota, Florida, they have the country's largest showroom of vibrational tools. So crystal bowls, Himalayan bowls, gongs, um, so many custom instruments as well that you might not see anywhere else. They also have trainings, workshops, and so many resources. So whether you find them online or in person, they can really help you up-level your sound practitioner world. So thank you so much to the Ohm Shop for their support and sponsorship of this podcast. Please enjoy this episode with Eric Lawrence. All right. Well, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for for joining me for this episode. It's great to have you here. It's such an honor. You know, what a beautiful series you have going and uh, it's an honor to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks so much. And it's been wonderful to learn more about you uh, for this particular interview. And you have such an amazing uh, background and I'm sure it's been uh, exciting to perform with and support so many legendary artists and your career as an artist, both musician, but poet and journalist is really, it's been really fun to learn about. So I'm excited to to share this with others. Uh, So why don't we go back uh, and when did you start music? How did music come into your life? Oh, okay. Well, um, I started at the age of five, I grew up in a musical family in that my father was a very, very accomplished jazz musician. His name was Arnie Lawrence, and he was a saxophone player um, in New York, big, what we'd say a big time saxophone player. He played on the Tonight Show and he was, I mean, he was in the Tonight Show band when it was in New York. And, um, but he also was a very, very creative musician and synesthetic musician. Uh, He was a virtuoso by 12 years old and um, uh, played with Dizzy Gillespie and, you know, Clark Terry and so many famous people. But, but his thing was always, you know, what's the next thing, you know, the, um, what was interesting to him was what could be creative, uh, created. Um, So he could recreate things. And I think that that's something, a skill that I've, I've, I've created around my own um, 
interests as well. But but uh, he, later on in his life, he started the jazz program at the New School in New York City, um, which was a very innovative program where really New York City became your you know your your teacher, and he had master musicians as the um, as as your professors. Max Roach was teaching a rhythm class and Barry Harris, you know, like people who actually invented the history were teaching you that history, which was a unique period of time that I grew up in, you know, where um, during, you know, if you look at the jazz musician part of my career, I played with everyone from, you know, the trombone player who played with Louis Armstrong to the most modern contemporary players of today, you know, and a lot of masters along the way. And um, so you're part of the living history of something, you know. Um, so that was what his school was about. And then he left that school because it, it became too structured for him because they needed it to be more structured, even though it was the new school. It's a very progressive socialist school. Um, and uh, he moved to Israel and he started a program in Jerusalem um, that wasn't accredited but uh, he had Jews and Palestinians playing improvised music together. And a lot of the great musicians from Israel and Palestine um, in the last, uh, I guess they started that, I guess, in 1997. So in the last 25 years, a lot of those great musicians um, studied directly with him or under the influence of his work. You know, so, so that was an incredible setting to, to come up in. You know, and in my family, there were four kids um, that grew up together. And when you turned five years old, you were given this little curved soprano saxophone uh, from 1921. And he taught you how to play it and where to put your fingers and how to blow and how to read a couple of notes. And they'd say, now play what you feel. And then I would say my entire career has just been doing that, you know, playing what I feel. And then Real, trying to realize what it was that I didn't know based on my surroundings and the people around me. And then learning that, I mean, I did a lot of school learning and I studied privately with people, but, but mostly it was being around a very, very naturally talented family and not being as naturally talented, but realizing all the time, what was, what I, what I wanted to have part of my playing and then putting that in, you're a teacher. So, you know, there's so, so many different learning styles and I've spent a lot of time teaching as well that um, in order to be a good teacher, I think is to be able to recognize and accommodate each one of those learning styles as best you can, you know, when you're teaching an orchestra, obviously that's hard to do, you know, so. Yeah. And jazz is so fascinating for me. You know, I come a, from a background where I learned both to play by ear and she and there's something about jazz that is very technical, very disciplined, but you have that freedom of impro improvisation as well that you don't necessarily in, in uh, some classical traditions, for example. So what do you think that type of training, um, both the technique and, and you know, really complexity, the complexities of theory of jazz, as well as improvisation and the freedom of it has, has lent to you as a musician and of course, uh, then going into more expressive and therapeutic arts. How do you think that has lent to that? Yeah, I love the way you put that question. Um, I I think that uh, jazz, which is a very, very ev um, amazingly evolving art form, you know, like we think about in our lifetimes, or at least in my lifetime, um, you know, watching how computers came up you know, and became so important and just how quickly they evolved, how, you know, the, you know, first he was 32K and then 128K and everybody was spending thousands of dollars on that. And now we're into terabytes and gigabytes and, you know, and, and, um, and beyond that. And it, it, uh, it evolves, you know, generations evolve every couple of years, as opposed to every 20 years or 30 years. And, and that kind of happened in jazz because the amount of evolution that happened in essentially what now is maybe 125 years, um, but but especially because I don't feel like that there's been a tremendous amount of evolution in the last 20 years. In the first 100 years, it's unbelievable. We were talking about 500 years worth, worth of evolution, but it, to break it down into its essentials, um, it's, uh, you know, first of all, it's a music that's based on European harmony and European song form. Um, you know, what we call our chords, 
how we write our rhythms and our notes, you know, our key signatures, all that stuff is based on European learning. Um, and what what we do differently than say somebody, somebody can go their entire career as a classically trained musician, just being adept at reading and um I mean, this is a, these are amazing skills we're talking about, but 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 at being able to read music, being able to interpret music, being able to put feeling into music or not put feeling into music, and being able, being able to play in a in an ensemble um, where you're really matching the people around you. And in jazz, you have to be able to do that, but you also have to do the opposite of that. And I feel like that's something that informed my entire career because um, as I became in um, I mean, I, think I was always an expressive musician and I was always like the only horn player in the band, except for, on, you know, rare occasions or in different situations. You know, it was like, okay, what's missing in this music? How can I complement this music? How can I, you know, help to bring this composer's vision to life? Which is something that I learned, like everybody else did, practicing, you know, Bach and practicing, you know, classical music. And also for me, practicing you know, trying to learn the very difficult um, solos of Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and Louis Armstrong and all those people who were virtuosos who um, didn't necessarily, very few of them came up in middle-class families or anything like that. Like the music was all they had, but it just shows the natural brilliance of human beings that they were able to create something so incredibly evolved. Whereas some things where were some things that were played in the 20s or the 40s or the 60s, I would say, um, are so incredibly evolved that all we can do is try to imitate them at this point. It's not like we're up to that level yet, you know? And I know that that's true of classical music as well. Um, so I'm not saying jazz is better, but but I'd say uh, what it requires of, of, of its practitioners is to be able to understand the rhythm and the notes and... Uh, but also the harmony and the structure of the song, and then be, be able to spontaneously compose and try to make that composition as, as good as the composition that came before it. And uh, your your biggest saving grace is that nobody else can play like you better than you can. So, you know, you just have to learn over the course of your career, uh, the sooner the better to play like yourself. And the sooner you can do that, you know, the better your chan the chance you have at, at being an expressive artist there's nothing to do with success or not you know but you know yeah yeah and from that amazing kind of roster of artists that you've performed with who did challenge or or, or push you the most as an artist Ooh. um well it's interesting i i um i would say the artist that i that i got a chance to work with it was it it had less to do with challenge and more to do with um, compatibility. Like if we were really compatible, like that's how we find each other. You know, if, um, if somebody wanted me to play in the style of somebody that I couldn't play it or, you know, in a, in a te technical manner that, that wasn't um, based on my training, then we probably wouldn't have stayed together very long. And I think there's, there's probably instant, a lot of instances of that, but, you know, I, uh, you know, I had these, what I call avatars. And, and this is one of those words that I feel like has been co-opted by modern culture that that really is one of the biggest travesties because, you know, what it used to mean was like a physical embodiment of a supreme being. And now it means like the cartoon character that you want to depict you on <laughs> in the little corner of your box. Um, so, uh, you know, bad job with the avatar word, hum humankind. So, um, but uh, I would say, you know, I worked with this, uh, legendary jazz drummer Chico Hamilton, and he was challenging because he want uh, my father had played with him, and he wanted me to play like my father. Is one of the few times that I ran into that instance. Was like, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not him. You know, you just got to take a moment and just really, you know, see if you can find beauty in what it is that I share. You know, and we never really jibed although he hired me twice in my career 20 years apart and he's the only person who ever fired me twice but we loved each other you know i knew him since i was a kid and we loved each other fired or not it, you know that didn't get in the way um i would say he challenged me i would say there was this um very visionary electric guitarist named uh, sonny Chirac, and um 
he challenged me just, but it was just to play music that I had never dreamed of playing before, you know, and another guy named David Tronzo, who was like that. Um, it was like, I, I play with him and then I would just dream about the music all night afterwards, but I was so excited about it. It was like a love affair, you know? And, um, uh, yeah, there, you know, there, there are people, you know, just, I, I would say anybody who's more advanced than me, Henry Butler, you know, virtuoso blind piano player from New Orleans, um, um, young Chen Lamo, you know, who's this incredible, um, Tibetan singer who's self-taught and you just really have to pay attention to what she's doing. She's, she'll never sing it in the same key necessarily or anything. She just sings and then you follow her, you know, um, but in some ways we work very, very well together because those were the talents that I had, I had cultivated was just being able to hear and, and respond, you know? Yeah. So I would say that that's how it informed me was to be able to rise up to, to challenges and um, to make sure that I had a reservoir of, of ability so that I could technically do what people are asking me to do. And, you know, um, that, that being said, you know, I tried playing Broadway once and I knew immediately it wasn't for me, you know, it was too political. It was too repetitive. You know, it's one of the reasons I never tried to play in an orchestra because I'd have to play the same thing every day. And that's, that's not what I got into this for, you know, me personally, but I admire people who do. Yeah. And, and that's right. All the different experiences you had and traveling and, and playing with all these people kept it interesting, kept you learning and growing because you were playing so many different styles and ways and um, and energy from other people. You know, the dynamic of the group that you're playing in uh, creates change and learning too. And just another thing from your background, um, is that right that you started teaching uh, music and jazz and poetry at colleges at the age of 18 how did how did that happen right well um actually I, I taught one specific course at the age of 18 and um uh i was i realized when i was in high school that i wanted to be a musician and i really started practicing as you know i i hope people still do you know 10 12 hours a day um and then my senior year i had the opportunity to go to a local community college um, which was academically pretty easy compared to the, you know, the, the advanced courses that I was taking in school, but um, it left me more time because by that time I was already playing in clubs five, six nights a week. Um, so um, my last, it was a junior college and my last semester, the very nice local um, orchestra conductor um, who at the time I thought was very old, uh, his name was Ed Simons and uh, he was wonderful very supportive of me. Um, he ended up teaching the jazz history class and jazz history was something that I, that I was really passionately interested in because I felt like when I realized I wanted to be a saxophone player and a flute player, um, I mean, there's way more history of the jazz saxophone. I realized I should just go back and study the entire history of the saxophone um, so that I really understand, you know, so, <clears throat> so I didn't have to reinvent any wheels. I could just learn everything that I love. Plus I love the sound and I love the, you know, all the different styles and voices and stuff like that. And then once I studied that, I realized I better, if I want to learn how to improvise, I have to be able to listen to the bass player and the piano player. So I listened to, I studied the history of each of those instruments. So by the time I got to this course, um, the guy who was supposed to teach it was this older kind of like West Coast jazz saxophone player I hadn't met. He caught, taught in a different department, but he liked teaching this class. And he took a sabbatical at the last minute. So uh, Ed Simons, Professor Simons taught it and he honestly knew nothing about jazz. So, so what he would do is there was a great radio program in New York back in those days in the seventies um, called um, WRVR. I mean, that was the, that was the station before WBGO and is now. And, and um, he would just record this one show of this very knowledgeable DJ who would tell you every player on the record and, um, the catalog number and which which take it was and all that stuff. Um, and he would just come in and play these tapes, but there was no rhyme or reason to the order of them. It would be like avant-garde jazz one day and Dixieland the next day and then swing and then jazz vocalists. And, um, you know, so after about two weeks of that, I got over being frustrated with him. And because we liked each other, I went up to him and said, hey, do you mind if I um, 
just sort of put this in some sort of chronological order and and just bring in stuff and play it so that people other people can understand it i uh, said oh man if you did that that would be great and so so i did that for the rest of the semester uh got an a of course and and uh and then about two weeks after that i you know i after the semester ended and I had my associate's degree and I was out doing gigs and done with school, as far as I was concerned, uh, he called me and said that the reg regular guy who taught the class was retiring and would I like to teach the class? So I was 18 years old and my hair was like out this far, believe it or not, it was out that far at one point. And, um, and I was going in, I was teaching mostly students who were younger than me. And, um, you know, and I taught it for several years and later on, uh, over the years, I taught at other schools where I did teach music and poetry and jazz ensemble and, you know, all kinds of other classes and stuff like that, you know. And then to bring us into um, the therapeutic use of sound, what sparked you to, well, investigate it? Uh, did you have an experience with sound that just interested you um, to explore how? music is is healing. Yeah. Yeah, I I'd say there's um there's a, a four part answer to that. You know, um not that I've rehearsed this or anything but but just as you say it I'm I'm hearing the four different elements. And the first one I would say is I've always been drawn to the spiritual element of 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 music. It's always been a, a strong part of my playing and I think one of the reasons why I got work when I was young was that I played with really with a lot of feeling and and sound and um so part two of that is that the reason that i played with sound is that when i got into practicing when i was in high school um was just during a time period where my parents marriage was falling apart and um you know so there's always that it has to touch you you know it has to you have to be coming from someplace and when i was taking um sound healing sound you know the sound institute at, at um sound and music institute at the open center in new york city years ago uh, they would tell you every week, uh, you can't take anybody anywhere where you yourself haven't been. And in that, we haven't all had cancer and we haven't all had, you know, lost, you know, somebody tragically or, or something like that. Um, we can we can find assimilation of that, you know, in our own experience or an experience of some, somebody that's happened close to us. Enough, you know, enough so that I feel like I can help people uh, and if I don't feel like I can, I, I just tell them that, you know, that's around my on my private work. But usually you just feel it so strongly um, that 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 you can put some music to that, like like a salve, you know, but but uh, during that time that my parents were. That there was so much tension in in the home, um, I would practice long tones on the saxophone. And I would listen to the people who have the most beautiful sounds, and I would really work on trying to find that sound within myself. And um, and what I realized now from my studies about sound and vibration is that I was sort of creating this force field around myself, not realizing that's what I was doing. And um, you know, and that you know, playing the lowest note as soft as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can on the saxophone, which is just an incredible you know, sound, which is very much like a bowed cello kind of sound. Um, and then I I actually evolved that to getting the entire saxophone sounding like that. Um, that that sort of is vibrating every bone in your body and maybe even my my younger siblings as well, you know, because I was, I, you know, unbeknownst to me, I was doing it to save my own life, you know? And, uh, and I would say that that's my initial connection. And as an aside to that, you know, my father, like I said, was a very creative musician. And uh, I was listening from the time I was very, very young to um, music that was really creative and really uh, emotional, like the music of the 60s and the 70s, that was very improvisational, where people were really, really expressing themselves. And a lot of that expression, um, which is what turned a lot of people off to jazz, was the more protest sounding avant-garde jazz of the 60s and the 70s of John Coltrane and, and the angry Charles Mingus, you know. Um, but to me, I always heard the beauty in their sounds and their right to be able to express themselves, just like we say people now have a right to protest. And it wasn't much different from Bob Dylan 
who I also played with, you know, um, you know, playing his angry protest music, you know, and doing it in the face of acoustic folk, you know, crowds that really didn't, didn't appreciate it at the time, you know, and now it's just commonplace to us, you know, so, um, so by listening to all that music, that recorded music by masters at the time, who I think were some of the most ascended, you know, self-realized masters that we had, um, I learned that I existed in that ethereal place in music. Like that was my, that was my home base, you know? So it's always been an element of my playing, you know? And then the, the two other things that I would say is that uh, years later, um, years ago, I, I, uh, I was in a relationship with a woman who played sound bowls and had t worked with Biosonics Tuning Forks, but although she had taught herself, she had never worked with Dr. John Beaulieu, who I think both of us have worked with. And, and, um, and she did amazing work and we did a lot of kirtan and sound bath together. And that was my experience of doing that, but I had already been playing solo concerts and, and musical meditations and, and my music was already moving in that direction but I didn't necessarily had the language around it so much. So I learned a lot from her. Her name was uh, Brooke Smokelin and she does amazing work. And then uh, the other thing is, yes, I did take the Sound Music Institute. I dedicated myself to, to doing that, but somebody I knew since high school, this woman, uh, Dr. Joanne Lowy is a, um, is a visionary music therapist who uh, started the program in New York City um, about 30 years ago. Um, called uh, the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine at Beth Israel Mount Sinai Hospital, which is called that because that was the hospital that Louis Armstrong went to when he was dying. And he appreciated their work so much that, um, that she created an association with um, Phoebe Jacobs, who was Louis Armstrong's publicist and the director of the Louis Armstrong House in Long Island, which was a house that is now made a museum. But, um, and there was that affiliation to keep that going. And anyway, um, Dr. Joanne Lowy and, and her team of music therapists and interns uh, do incredible work. And I've been on the board now of uh, the two different boards of that center um, for, um, for many years. And I get to go to a lot of symposiums and seminars and see how music therapists work, which is a different thing from what you and I do. And, uh, and that's incredible work too. They help people, as a matter of course, they help people get out of comas using music. They um, help people find their voices back after they've had strokes. You know, they, uh, they work in neonatal units. They work with end of life care. They do, they work with COPD and with cancer, um, you know, review and all, and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, it, it's been incredible for me to be able to, to see what that work is as well. And to also sort of be the person who, one of the people who who works between those. I, I know that you you had Katie down, and she's both a sound healer and a music therapist. And um, you know, I don't know if you've if you've met Frank Bosco yet, but he's also a really visionary um, healer who happens to be a music therapist. But he's unbelievably intuitive, you know. Um, so there, you know, there's some people out there, but but. Um, but the Armstrong Center is is a very cool place, and they've helped music therapy centers get started all over the world, you know, and that's great because I feel about that the same way I feel about everybody who's 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 creating course, you know, sound healing courses now or taking them and or who's going out and buying their first set of bowls or tuning forks is that uh, at this time, the world needs as many light workers as possible. And as long as you're working with a pure heart, um, you know, fortunately we're, we're using a, a non-medical modality that, that, um, you know, that, that uh, if there's any negative response to it, which almost never happens, you can just pull those tuning forks away. And, and, you know, it's not like you have to come down off of the, you know, off the mountain, you know, with these drugs in your system or whatever, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, I have a couple of follow up questions. I think I'll start with, you know, you know, from being on the board and, and being involved with music therapy and also being involved in sound healing and sound meditation. Um, do you feel that there can or should be more integration 
of this field into Western medicine or, you know, some sound mindfulness in the hospitals? Do you see that happening? Or do you think because it is more a holistic field that um, perhaps music therapy is the, you know, what should be in the hospitals? Well, you know, I always say, um, you know, music is what got us into this. Music is what should get us out of this. You know, um, I I feel like these natural healing modalities uh, that there's there's a place for them. You know, and it's proven. You know, the nice thing about uh, like these music, music therapy programs is that they they can prove that having music in ICU not only calms down the patients, but also the nurses and the doctors, you know, and, you know, so they get that testimony from them right off the bat. Um, and I don't, I don't see situations where, where music gets in the way, even though there's no one particular music that's going to be the, the you know, the, the magic for everybody, you know, some people are going to want to listen to Metallica and some, you know, and some people, you know, people want white noise to go to sleep or people want, you know, angelic voices or, you know, electronica or what, you know, whatever EDM, you know, it's different for everybody, but, you know, it, it comes down to what it comes down to be, being, what it comes down to what being a musician comes down to, which is you want it to say on your report card, what it says, uh, on your kindergarten report card plays well with others. You know, you have to be able to listen to what the person is is needing or asking for and give it to them as clearly and as simply as possible. You know, and if you go in there saying, well, okay, I know that this, you know, uh, 432 is going to do the trick for you. And, um, you know, some people just are immune to it. And I've worked with musicians who were, um, you know, like I have a friend who's a who's a very, very sensitive musician and plays a lot of instruments. And we were doing this long recording session together and um, he had developed diabetes and he, he had blood sugar issues and all this other stuff. So we're a couple of hours into it. And when he started to to get all wrapped up, I said, let me use these tuning forks because it's going to put you right back in balance with your circadian rhythms. This I know because not because I trust what they told me, but because I, I've done it enough times with people where I see what it does and he could have repelled it more, you know, and, um, you know, and, and I realized that there was a bigger issue going on, you know, and I wasn't sure what it was and, you know, <laughs> had to be able to say, I'm not sure what that is, but, you know, but, but you need to see somebody who's got a skill level past mine and this one, you know? Yeah. And as you started to actually study sound therapy and what we could call sound medicine, um, what did you realize you already knew and what surprised you about the science and, and kind of, uh, what's going on with sound and vibration as, as you studied it? That's a really interesting. Um, well, I'm the kind of person who, like they always say you're a musician too, right? So, so, uh, Natalie and, and um, they always say, you know, music and math go hand in hand together. And I always say, um, that's funny that you say that because if you can count to eight, you can pretty much do anything in music, you know? But if you're good at either remembering or recognizing sequences, then we have something here because it's all sequences and patterns. And another thing that they that they taught at uh, SMI was uh, human. Um, Wendy Young was my teacher that year, and, and uh, Wendy and and, uh, and Stephanie Rooker were the were the coordinators of the class. And Wendy always liked to say, um, "The human mind craves patterns," you know. And I think in patterns all the time. That's why I love that artwork behind you. You know, it just lights me up. You know, and and um, but but what I what I feel like the last frontier is is not using patterns you know uh, the last frontier of melody is our larger intervals and you know these are my secrets there's they're not really any secrets it's just what i've realized and i could tell everybody in the world what my secrets are and they're going to do something different with them and that's what i love about um about this you know there's some things that the basics can be codified but but um but not the putting the basics into practice 
yes, of course, we all are going to say, well, okay, you know, I haven't experimented with sixths or ninths or or elevenths, you know, intervals. And um, so I'm going to do that. So then everybody's going to experiment with that. And then music is going to sound like that, like that happened after Thelonious Monk, you know, it's, um, you know, um, but we're still going to do different things with it. You can't listen to everything that has six and minor seconds in it and say, it sounds like Thelonious Monk. You know, eventually you're like, well, it sounds like Chick Corea trying to sound like Thelonious Monk. You know, it's, um, it's, you can you can codify anything, but it still comes down to the individual voice. And I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, I love how you put that. I really do. And so as you started to explore doing that in meditations, um, you know, kind of musically guided meditations, and I think, um, as you call them, sound sanctuary, how did you find that coming together? How did you uh, approach your saxophone or flute? Um, perhaps differently differently than you might in a jazz club, of course, but just, you know, yeah. can you kind of talk us through how you approach these sound meditations and the instruments you're using? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a lot of instruments. So I, I play, um, I should just say, I play kind of all the saxophones, which is basically four saxophones, um, soprano, alto, tenor, and baritone. And I play a lot of flutes. So I have, um, you know, a uh, regular C flute, the concert flute, alto flute I've had for a long time. And I've always wanted a bass flute and I got one during the pandemic and it's now my best friend and I use it almost all the time. Um, it just, it sounds like my voice, you know, it's just like, it sounds like you're whispering in somebody's ear, something deep and meaningful. That's what I want it to sound like. And, um, and but I've been listening to uh, Shakuhachi flute and, Indian Bansuri flute masters for as long as I can remember, you know, so it's always been part of me, you know, and, and I was fortunate enough to, to, um, to live in a household where we had, you know, where we listened to Ravi Shankar, you know, way back when, you know, when the hippies were listening to it in the sixties and I grew up, you know, I was young, but I, I lived in the sixties, grew up in the sixties and the seventies. And then in the late seventies, um, my local high school, uh, not high school, but but like the the county had a concert series, and it would always be like the um, you know a Dixieland group from New Orleans, you know Preservation Hall, and you know Pete Seeger, and you know and and one year they had Ravi Shankar, and I went to see him, and it was just like a local nondescript high school auditorium. And I was probably about 17 years old and I went with a friend of mine and she and I always played flutes together. We go in the woods and play flutes together. So that, you know, this goes back a long way for me. And, um, and it was just like a nondescript high school auditorium, but they had all the lights out. They had a giant carpet on the, on the stage. These three musicians came out, a woman playing the drone instrument, a sarod and, and, um, the great master Alaraka on tabla, who is Zakir Hussein's father, and Ravi Shankar on on, uh, on sitar, and we just went, and they had candles and incense burning, and uh, all of a sudden we were just transformed. And I went into this amazing place that I've been seeking my entire life ever since. You know that I've been trying to recreate. So I'd say that that's that's a big part of it. Um, and then you know, of the musicians that I listened to, they would always be able to play these long solo cadenzas at the beginning or the end of their songs. And that to me always felt like a prayer. And my father created a lot of prayer music for, um, uh, in the, in the, in the mid late seventies for at that time, the new Jewish Hebrew union prayer book. So, um, I was always connected to the fact that music was prayer. And then when I started doing those, those, um, sound baths with Brooke, I would play flute. And I'm not I'm not saying anything disparaging about her, but she always wanted me to play long tones. And I always was like feeling stuff from people in the audience and wanting to give them some assurance. So I would just create these little melodies because she was just playing bowls and those were very fixed tones. And, um, and she wanted and I was getting in her way, basically, I, like she wanted to be able to control the flow of things. But since I was playing the melodic instrument, even though I was playing way fewer notes than I normally play a, in a solo, uh, I was playing way more notes than she wanted me to. So eventually we came to a compromise, which was 
that she would get a didgeridoo player and I would do my own thing. <laughs> so at any rate, um, but, uh, but I appreciate that kind of a sound bath. And uh, what I should say is that when I do what I call sound sanctuary, um, which is another kind of, you know, what I would say, you know, best description is a, a musically guided meditation or a musically guided journey, you know, because people always come up to me and, and, or they don't come up to me, but they, they have different experiences and I don't set them up with that experience. I don't tell them, you know, imagine yourself here or there, or, you know, like, or very rarely, sometimes something's going on in the world, we'll put our mind towards something to, so that collectively, you know, I think there's a great, great power in that. And, um, you know, so, so what I do is still, however many people are in the room, um, or if I'm doing it solo on my own, I set my mind to something, I feel something, I feel things from the people in the room. And then what I try to do and I think the arc to my journey, which I think is is kind of interesting, is is um, is, is that I I try to acknowledge what's really there. You know, there's some darkness going on in your life. There's some challenge. I want you to know that I feel it. Whether you know if it's one on one, if you shared it with me, or if I just feel it, you know, just by the look of you when you come in the room, or how you're sitting, or 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 whatever it is that sends me that message. And somewhere in that meditation, we go down there um, and we feel that darkness. I want them to feel that I feel what they feel and then bring them out of it into the light. And uh, that's kind of the arc of most of my sound sanctuaries. They're all very, very different. And I play whatever instruments and I've accumulated, I also have a lot of wooden flutes and things that I've gotten from all over the world. And, you know, it's interesting because I listen to other people's stories and, um, uh, and, and I can do this. Obviously I have had a lot of masters and a lot of mentors uh, in my life, but I, I really do feel like it's, you know, you, you read, you know, for me, it's about reaching a mastery on your instrument and then being able to respond and to respond in a way that, that moves something in a positive positive direction. And I think when I decided that I wanted to dedicate more of my work into this, you know, music, music medicine, we'll call it, you know, um, I was looking for somebody who was a mentor or, a, you know, like, or a decider to give me permission, you know, and when you take a course like the Sound Music Institute at, at the Open Center, you study with 10 or 12 different people who are masters at what they do, excuse me, and and, um, and not one of them rose up to be the person that I needed to ask permission for to do what I wanted to do, which was to create music for people who were who were in pain on a one-to-one -one basis or in a group group basis, because nobody was particularly doing that, even though that is essentially what music, healing music is all about. Um, so, but this is a very specialized thing. I'm a lifelong improviser. You know, I've, I've reached a particular level of, of mastery over my instruments, of the instruments that I carry with me that I've chosen. Um, I have an intimate relationship with every sound that that instrument creates, you know? And, um, you know, I'm not saying that I'm the best or I'm the greatest at anything. I'm just saying this is, this is where I am with my instruments, you know? And it's, it humbles me every day you know, I wake up every morning and I go to sleep every night humbled by the amount of stuff that I I know that I need to do in this day or in this lifetime, you know, but, um, but I also know where I stand, you know, and I wake up the next morning to try again, you know. Um, so, so I would say, you know, all these things have brought me to the point where, you know, what I want to do is bring people to a place of beauty and of comfort because it's a very, very hard world, you know, and let's, you know, I, I studied the four noble truths for a really long time. And, um, and I would say decades went by where I could get past the first, first noble truth, which is all beings suffer. And, um, and it's like, well, why? Why do we have to suffer? You know, like, why does that mean? Why is it a fact? Why is that the primary fact that we all suffer? 
And then when I finally realized, oh yeah, it's true, we all we all do suffer. Then I started working on the second noble truth, which is the cause of that suffering is attachment, you know. And um, and then I started working with this amazing woman, Young Chen Lamo. I mentioned her before. She came from Tibet. She crossed across the Himalayas with her baby on her back at the age of 19, a thousand miles. Um, she wasn't a singer, although her, her name, Young Chen Lamo, means goddess of song and, and or priestess of song. And, and, um, and, and, her, ma and, and her, her high priest, her master told her, you know, you should sing. And she's like, I don't know how to sing. I said, yeah, but you should sing. And she started singing, you know, and she's, she's like a truly self-realized master, you know, and uh, I would go to visit her in upstate New York. And um, at one time I said, listen, I have a question for you. Can I ask you a question about the Four Noble Truths? I said, um, you know, it took me a long time to get past the first. And then I got to the second one. And I don't know how in this lifetime I'm going to get through all four of these Noble Truths. And she laughed at me the way that real Buddhists laugh at people. And, and uh, she said, uh, you Westerners all think that you can learn everything from a book. <laughs> Mm, that's right. Yeah. Experience is the best teacher, though, is what we eventually learn. Yeah. Well, so where are you offering? Where are you bringing these guided uh, meditations to? What kind of environments have you been able to pr present them in? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a great. Um, it's a it's a wide range because I travel um, with other kinds of music. I sometimes get to do them. So I've you know, I, I'm based in the Northeast uh, and mostly lived in New York most of my life. Right now I'm in Pittsburgh. So I will do them, you know, just to be doing them here. Like there's a place here in Pittsburgh called uh, Sneha. Uh, it's a healing arts center. And um, ironically, in a part of Pittsburgh called Lawrenceville, has nothing to do with me. And and uh, um, and it's a, a beautiful spot run by a wonderful person. And um I'll do that there about once a month. There's another place, and I see these places popping up all the time. There's a place called Tuned Wellness on the other side of Pittsburgh in Monroeville, um, which is dedicated to uh, sound healing practices, you know, which is uh, which I just really love and, and want to support uh, the woman, Adrian, who, who runs that. And, and I'm noticing just yesterday, I found two other places in central Pennsylvania. So I love to go to those places and support them. And, you know, I think it, you know, um, if my resume helps them to, you know, you know, but we're helping each other, you know, because they've done, they've done the hard work to like get out of their other lives and, and start this because they think the community needs it. And it does, you know, but I'm, I'm just really happy to see that those places exist, but that being, you know, but to answer your question, uh, I've done them um, all over the New York area. Uh, for a while there, I was just numbering them. I'd just be, you know, I first started, it was like Sound Sanctuary number one and and so on and so on. Now I don't number them, but I still have them and I record most of them. And, you know, at some point I'm going to build a, a website where they can all be downloaded. And uh, I have the website already, but I haven't posted them up there yet. It's um, Sound Sanctuary. Uh, it's uh, ericlawrencemusic.com, um, Eric with a K. And, and, uh, and uh, but I've done solo in Israel, in Jerusalem. I've done it in Vancouver. I've done them. Um, I'm just trying to think. I've just sort of been all over the place. I I was walking around in St. Louis in, in uh, Kansas City one time, and two blocks from my hotel was this crazy looking church. It turned out it was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And the, the woman who's the who's the pastor there like let me in and showed me the sanctuary and the sanctuary is incredible so you know i'd like to go back there and do one there just because you know frank lloyd wright the acoustics are just really beautiful and it's a wild looking almost like egg egg shaped kind of room that's suspended off the ground <laughs> and um yeah i i've i've done too many but but there are places that have popped up in new york and i've, I've done done them there and um and I'm open to doing more. And then now, um, my partner uh, Denise McMorrow, who's an artist and a psychologist and a um, and 
her work goes beyond that deeply into the spiritual and shamanic kind of realm. Uh, she's doing like some of these paintings that you see behind us. Um, she's created this thing, this thing called the prayer tent for the divine mother. And it's a tent with these, these paintings that are six feet by three feet uh, that are surrounding you with messages from uh, these different embodiments of divine mothers. And I put music to all that and her voice to it. So we're creating these immersive experiences. And that's something that I'm really, really interested in, in um, developing and, and uh, making a bigger part of my life because it just, I've seen how directly that work has affected people and how the music actually works with it, you know, but uh, and literally like we, we've, we've it's been out. It, we've been doing it for a year and a half now, and we're about to, you know, put the tent in different places. But uh, for this year's, for this, you know, seasons this year, and uh, it's just changed the lives of hundreds of people already. And you know, we've just done it on a small scale, and it's really an act of service, you know. But uh, uh, I also am, you know, do do private one on one sessions, and in that, I really like to do them one you know in person and most of those sessions well let's see um just to describe you haven't asked this question yet but i'll say you know i've worked with people at end of life or people who are grieving um that for whatever reason just feels very very comfortable to me uh but people uh have come to me with all kinds of work related stress or different kinds of trauma um and you know I would I would say that that if they're open and ready to do the work, I, you know, I'm I'm ready to pull them through some doors. And and the beauty of of music is that it it takes you to a different realm than this particular earthbound realm. Um, so since I'm I always sort of have one foot in that realm, uh, it I I can I can be your guide you know, or, or bring you there and, and just give you some peace and comfort. It, it might not be lasting, but what I, what I'm doing with this creating music for people thing that I was describing before is that I'll record that music and then send it to you. You know, it's sort of like this special service and that'll be your kind of like a, um, you know, constitutional remedy in, in homeopathy. You know, like you're, I have a, a person who came to me and she had a lot of stress around a job change that she's going through. She didn't trust her new bosses, but it was a step up and she had anxiety and it turned out she was right. She should have had anxiety about it. And uh, I created some music for her that you could listen to every day on the train on the way to work in New York and, you know, um, listen to at night if she's having trouble falling asleep. And for that period of time, that was the right remedy for her. And it was for her and it was based on things that she shared with me and a cultural style that, that spoke to her directly, you know, which is something that, because I do play in a lot of styles, I, you know, like I have an understanding about that, but it's usually solo flute or solo saxophone or something like that. So that's the kind of thing that I can do um, with a zoom call, you know, and I mean, obviously I have other techniques and um, you know, I do work with, other modalities, but unlike, um, you know, so, somebody that connected us, um, Michelle Pere, you know, is a really dear friend of mine and uh, we're very, very connected in wonderful ways. Like we have the same birthday and, um, and uh, we're very complimentary as people together. Um, she shows up with a truckload of, of uh, really amazing and expensive instruments. And I can show up with like, almost like a little doctor's medicine bag um, because with me, it's like, it's internal and it's these well-chosen instruments. And I really only need, need a few. Um, but the, but the work is really, really deep. So I, I'm not saying you don't need those things. I'm saying I don't need those things. <laughs> and, um, and, and it, I could show up with one flute or, or some tuning forks, depending on, on what it is. So it's what the person needs, you know, but obviously if I'm creating music for you, then that, you know, that's, that's something's special but but um but that's the right thing you know and if it's the right thing you always want to do the right thing you know this stuff is serious it's as serious as life and it's at the core of the things that that most of other life like money and you know job pressures and all those things and like none of that stuff can touch this like we're at the heart and we stay at the heart and we don't um 
ever let it get any less deep than that. You know, like it never comes comes to the surface. Like we have to stay at the heart in order for this work to work. Otherwise, you're better off with a pill or a drug or a, you know, you know, or a gummy or something like that. You know, this is, you know, if you want to do heart work, you got to go. You got to stay in the heart. You know. Right. And that brings it kind of back to, to your point of, you know, uh, playing 432 hertz for, for someone might be great, but for someone else, it might not. That is almost kind of the pharmaceutical model using a specific frequency for a specific thing. And, and you really tuning into someone's energy and intention and then creating um, a music melody for them is really individualized for, for them in, the, in that moment and, and their intention. So that's that's beautiful. Um, and you did actually kind of come to my last question, but maybe there, there's more. I'm just mm. talking about what you're really excited about right now. And you mentioned your work with your partner and, and the tent and all that you've created, but yeah. what are you what are you dreaming forth? What's, what's coming up for you that you're really curious or excited about? Well, uh, a dream that I really do have is something that, I think touches upon um, what all the people that I know who create sound meditations um, need, which is to create some sort of a, a of a place where all those meditations can be. That's not um, the Calm app or something like that, you know, or the the music for yoga app. I know there's something like that that yoga studios rent, but to create something that's curated, that's that's um you know that people can go to and say well i really like this music because it has um strings or i really like this because it has nature sounds in it or, or or whatever and to then just be able to to get all that and to put us in a position see because i i come from being a musician who plays with bands and stuff like that or who you know puts out my own original music or music and poetry which almost nobody's interested in um but i am and that's why i do it and and um like you don't, you can't do it because you think somebody else is going to like it. You have to do it because it's your best idea or it's because it's the thing is closest to your heart. And otherwise people can tell. That's what I see. I have the unique experience of like being on stage at the New Orleans Jazz Festival in front of 60,000 people and watching them burst into tears when the music starts, you know, and that's my experience of how sound heals people, you know, how music is, is, is that powerful in people's lives, you know, why people get in their car after a long stressful day of work and turn up the radio and listen to whatever it is, Jewel, or, you know, you know, whatever it is that they like, you know, uh, Pavarotti, you know, and, um, and all we have to do is acknowledge that in other people. I mean, anybody I've ever come to and said, you know, music is healing, you know, part of my thing with the Louis Armstrong center is getting, you know, helping to find somebody famous for their fundraiser to help to fund their programs, you know, and, you know, I called Jackson Brown and he's just like, yeah, of course, music is so healing for people. You know, what can I do to help? You know, I mean, he's the nicest guy in the world, but, but, you know, uh, but, but lots of other people too, you know, that, that, uh, that have, that have joined that, you know, who have been recipients. So I, you know, I would say we have to, we have to find a way so that all of our music can get out there to people because otherwise we're putting it on Spotify or Pandora. And I'm sorry for everybody who subscribes to those things, but they don't take care of the artists. You know, I know people who've had 60, I'm not complaining. I don't think we're victims. I think that we we're, we're very, very lucky to have got this far in our lives and do what we do, you know, and have the tools that we need and, you know, and we get by. You know, we're not necessarily, you know, we're not doing this to get rich and we're not getting rich. And, and, but, but, but like somebody said, you know, this husband and wife couple, they're doing this healing music and I want you to hear it because it really touches me. So I went and they gave me a Spotify link and I, link and I don't have Spotify, but uh, you could click on it and still listen to it. And I was like, oh, let me find out about this. Well, let's see. They had 38,000 plays and at, the rate the rate that Spotify Spotify pays 0. 0.0006 cents per play, it's something like a uh, dollar and twelve cents. Like that's what they get, you know. So you can have millions of plays and not still not make minimum wage. And then 
where's the where's the value in that? So I feel like that, that there's got to be a way to. Uh, so if anybody out there listening has got lots of money, you know, you can fund this and we can curate it and and make it happen. It's going to take care of, of musicians. They're going to get more than their fair share of, you know, 0. 0.0006 cents better than that. You know what I mean? Because I just won't even play that. It just it just hurts. So if you want to hear my music, you know, you can go to SoundCloud or Bandcamp. Um, I ha also have a page on YouTube where I was doing um, these meditations after the George Floyd um, incident during the pandemic, where I was just sitting in my room and not working. But I was just saying, I'm just going to, you know, I don't feel like it's my place to say something now. It's the, you know, the microphone is not in my hand, but I wanted to do something in support. So I did all these meditations on different instruments um, for eight minutes and 46 sec seconds, which was at the time we thought the length of time that the knee was on his neck. And, and, uh, and uh, that was the way I showed support and people send in money. And I sent half of it to Black Lives Matter and, and also to the um, Navajo COVID relief fund, you know, and which is, I wasn't making money, any money at all. So it was great to get some money, but you know, like I didn't feel like it was supposed to all be mine, you know? Yeah, there was still an energy exchange there. You know, there was still intent and in how that energy was and or and money was getting distributed. So yeah, yeah, it's important. You know, you've made an investment in your life uh, as a musician and yourself and all the work you've put in that yes, to be celebrated and sustained in some kind of energy exchange is important. Yeah. 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 I just, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I see how music affects people and I would like to be able to give what I, what I have as gifts to people for the rest of my life and hopefully get something in return. And, and, um, it, and I think that what I do at this point is, is evolved and unique. And, uh, you know, I've never needed to be Kenny G or, or, or anybody else, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I think I had the benefit of having extremely gifted father, jazz musician, father, um, where I never had this um, delusion that I wanted to be the best at anything. I just wanted to be one, you know, and I didn't want to be him. I just wanted to be, be me and do what he told me when I was five, which is play what you feel, you know? And I, I'd say so far, that's what I've done. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, Eric. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, everything that you've, you've shared with us and everyone stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be able to listen to one of Eric's compositions at the end of, of this episode and experience a sample of his work. Anything else you'd like to share as we come to a close here? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't say compositions because I would say improvisations, you know, okay. Med meditations. Yeah, sure. yeah, let's say meditations. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, I would just say people just remember to be kind to each other, you know, and be kind to yourselves, you know, and, uh, you know, if things are going rough for you, hum, really hum and feel it, you know, feel it here and feel it here and feel it here and feel it everywhere that you can, you know, and just, uh, just get that vibration, keep that vibration going, tap, you know, do that tapping. Um, and, uh, you know, and call out for help when you need help. Yeah, beautifully said, especially the power of using vibration for our own self-care. You know, it's it's there for us to tap into. So, yeah. 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 All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Eric. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and connect with you in this way. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you for including me in your series and, and uh, good luck to you. And oh, I listened to your, some of your music. It's, it's oh. beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And, and likewise. likewise. Yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care.
Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast, sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa. You can keep up to date with what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com. Check things out on Facebook at Sounds Heal Studio. And you can listen to all previous podcasts as well as music meditations on the YouTube channel at Sounds Heal Studio. Be well and stay tuned.